Hello everybody, I'm Keith Marciniak. I'm back again with CC Doucette from Ashland, Massachusetts. Last time we spoke, we spoke about your journey on finding the dangers of Wi-Fi. Yeah. You brought the concern to your school board. Mm -hmm. They weren't sure what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So now you're on a bigger quest. You're going to bring this to your state senator. <laughs> So, well, as impressive as that sounds, Keith, sound I impressive. didn't have a cape or anything. It oh. was just when our school committee was looking for a higher authority to help them direct what they're going to do with this new knowledge that they have, there wasn't anybody at the local level or at the state level. And so when our superintendent didn't feel they were in a position to start educating the community, I thought, well, how can we do this? And so I knew our Board of Health didn't know. Um, and so I went to local coffee hours with Senator Karen Spilka, who is my local senator. And I had had the privilege of working alongside of her when I helped to run the Local Education Foundation. And so we knew each other. She knew I wasn't just, you know, a crazy lady coming in off the street. And so I met with Senator Spilka and her district director in a local coffee shop during her office hours. And I educated her on what we covered in the last session, that there is a huge body of scientific evidence indicating biological harm from all of our rapidly adopted wireless technology. Did she have any idea? No, she didn't have any idea. And so what I did, by, by that point in my journey, I knew that this was so hard for people to get their minds around because, like you said, we can't see it, we can't smell it, we can't hear it. We might feel it, but people don't know that that's what they're feeling. Right. So how do you know? And I discovered that there are actually meters available that um, will measure how much exposure we have to microwave radiation. So I brought my meter with me when I met with Senator Spilka, and I measured her cell phone and her district director's laptop. And if you want to do a quick demonstration here, I'll tell you what this meter is. It's called an acoustometer, meaning that you're going to be able to hear the signal as well as see a digital readout. And then like a stop sign, a green, yellow, and red display, depending yeah. on how much radiation is in the air. Okay. So when I turn this on, if there were no radiation in the room, it would just crackle a little bit to confirm that the, the mm -hmm. meter's working. But when it goes green, that's still below the level that today we recognize there's biological effects. That could change over time as we get smarter about this. When it goes into yellow, that's where people who have developed electrosensitivity or electrohypersensitivity for those who become very ill, okay. that's where they start feeling symptoms in the yellow area. In the red, we have a massive body of scientific, peer-reviewed, credible, published studies that say this is biologically harmful. So when you show this to the senator, are you doing the same thing you did with the <laughs> yeah, senator I'm now? Yeah, I'm doing the same thing with you. So okay. right here, right now, this goes into yellow. Mm -hmm. So that's where the scientists indicate there's biological harm happening, whether we feel it or not. And you notice it popped up into red, and that's because all of our devices, when they're, in, well, when they're in active mode, are constantly yeah. looking for a handshake with either the cell antenna to the cell tower, or the Wi-Fi antenna to the router, right. or the Bluetooth antenna to the Bluetooth um, tower. You mm -hmm. know, so when you look at a cell tower, there's a whole bunch of stuff up there. There's a Bluetooth antenna. There's a cell antenna. There's a data antenna. We've got Wi-Fi antennas. We have locator antennas. The locator, right? So our one little device can have up to like five antennas in it. So this radiation is just from the studio. Yeah. If I take this off airplane mode. Yeah. And I'll turn on the audio now, too. That's the cellular. So, I can put on the Bluetooth. Yeah. But we're already off the charts here just with... Yep, got a text Just with in. the way that everybody uses their phone today. What's the level we at now? Yellow? Uh, no, we're topped off out of red. We're off the charts oh, with this so meter. So, when I'm carrying this around in my pocket, on my body, that's that's what's hitting your cells all day long. So when I did this with Senator Spilka, she and, and her district director were looking at me like, Oh my God, no one <laughs> told like, us. They're like, really? <laughs> exactly. And I said, yes, and nobody knows. nobody knows. I said, is there something at the state level we can do to begin educating and informing people? And like I've said before, it's a right to know issue. People still drink. They still do drugs. They still, you know use tobacco, whatever. Right. 
but people don't even know that we're exposing our families to this. So she was very gracious and she put me in touch with a lawyer in her office. This was a tool to this, say, this, look, yeah. I can hear it, I can see it. Right. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. So I um, worked with a gentleman in her office, Aaron Carty, who's a lawyer, and together we crafted a very simple bill. It's Senate number 1222, front page, back page, double spaced, not fancy. That could fancy. be on the internet? You can find that yeah. with a search? Okay. And it basically just says, let's get the right minds at the state level together to look at this. So let's get school committee people, let's get pediatricians, let's get environmental medicine experts, because our regular doctors don't know about this, That's right. but environmental doctors do. Mm -hmm. um, and then let's get, you know, the Department of Public Health, let's get the utility companies, the, you know, telecom companies, let's get everybody at the table, hammer this out and start protecting our public. So she said the way to do that is to form a commission. So we now have this bill in the Senate mm -hmm. to form a commission to get the right people to start looking at this. And I said... What year was this? This was in January of 2015. Okay. And the legislative sessions go for two years. Mm -hmm. So when, it, when Senator Spilka introduced it from the Senate, the House gave it the nod and then it was assigned to the Joint Committee on Public Health. I'm impressed. I this was too. I, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm not very politically savvy. So you meet savvy. With the right people. <laughs> you met with your senator. I think there's angels looking over me. Well, you um, have an important <laughs> topic. So yeah. it has a life of its own. Right. Because people hear it. It resonates. I want to do something right. to help you. Right. So I said to Mr. Cardi in Senator Spilka's office, you know, so now what happened? She's introduced the bill. It's been assigned to the Joint Committee on Public Health. He said, sometime between now, which was January of 2015, and the spring of 2016, this bill will come up for public hearing. For funding. Is that well, what, is just, that what that is? just so the people on the committee can be informed. Okay. And so I said, okay, so what does that mean? And he said, well, on very short notice, this will get assigned to come up on an agenda. We'll let you know, and then you have three minutes to testify. Okay. And I'm thinking, okay, three minutes is better than nothing, right? That's right? So that was January, and I thought, okay, I can finally take a breath because I hadn't planned on spending so much of my time investigating this and doing what I'm doing. I could get back to my family, my community. It's been and about two years it's now. It's been right? borrowed time, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was kind of a relief. So from January till May, I hadn't heard anything. And then on May 20th of 2015, I got a call and it was a woman referencing my bill and I thought it was Senator Spilka's office, but it wasn't. It turned out to be another woman by the name of Patricia Burke who mentioned a second bill that's in the Boston, Massachusetts legislature. And that's House Bill 2868 and it's regarding um, smart meters, mm -hmm. and if people don't want to have this Wi-Fi device mounted on their homes, she's hoping that they will be given the option to opt out. We never opted in to have these smart right. meters on our so homes. So do they have? So you have these all these communities in Worcester County. Mm -hmm. Do they have a right to say I don't want this on my well, house? Well, we should, but okay. um, when I got to go to the day that her bill came up for testimony. We had to sit through like four hours of other bills that mm -hmm. were on the energy docket. And I learned about a thing called environmental justice. And in a nutshell, what that means is that large companies will come in with their toxic products, uh, roll them out in a low income, largely uneducated, poor community where nobody's likely to know enough to raise their hand and go, I don't think that's a good choice. So right now, National Grid is rolling out the smart grid in Worcester. And I used to hear about the smart grid. You mean grid. they couldn't roll it out in Concord or Lexington? Well, no, because people there <laughs> already have been fighting cell towers. Right, they right. know that they don't want this technology snapped onto their homes. Right, and they know that. So right, so let me, I didn't know very much about these smart utilities. Um, so I reached out to my Department of Public Health in my town or, or public utilities. And I said, so where are we with adopting, you know, smart meters and really what are they? 
And when I was a little kid playing hide and seek, I'd be in the bushes and I'd be sitting there looking at my meters yeah. and watching those little dials go around. Well, Hypnotized. that's called an analog meter. Yeah, right. Yeah, right? <laughs> Why is this spinning backwards? Ollie, Ollie, Austin, <laughs> free. Um, right. So those are just mechanical devices, and they don't emit any electromagnetic radiation. What we're seeing now is those are being converted out, and the digital devices are coming in. So I asked my town, well, what do we have? Are we on the smart grid? And they said, no, we're not on the smart grid. What we've done is we've replaced the electric meters with digital meters. And I said, okay, what does that mean? And they said, well, what that allows us to do is to do some cost saves. So we used to have somebody walk the neighborhood yeah, and take the readings once yep. a month. Now what they can do is have a drive-by, stop in front of your house, shine their wireless device to my wireless meter, get a reading, and then drive on. But they're only there for like three seconds out right. of the month. Right. The other 30, 31 days, you know, 365 days on. a year, 24-7, yep. it's pulsing this electromagnetic radiation, and it goes through walls, and it goes through ceilings, and it goes through floors. So even though it's facing out, it's still radiating the back into is, the home. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I thought, okay, so then what's the smart grid? Now, what is a smart grid? What is I, a smart grid? I hear so much about There's it. There's a great diagram in this brochure. Um, smart utility meters, are they smart for you? And you can find this online too. But I love this little diagram because I thought, okay, this is going to allow the utility company to do a drive by. Now we can eliminate that and save even more money and just have the data go right from my house off to the utility company. Mm -hmm. But that's not actually how the grid works. So let's say this is your house, this is my house, you know, and so on down the line. It aggregates my data, sends it to your house, picks up your data. No. Yeah. Oh, my God. All of our data is now going down the line, and the person who's living nearest to this transformer that's out on a pole... Oh, my. I didn't know that. ...is getting a ton of electromagnetic radiation. And all our information's going right here, not even right off to the utility company. So when you're driving around now, you can look up and see things. I saw something, I think it might be a WiMAX antenna, mm -hmm. and it almost looks like a little chime with three things hanging off of it on a box. Well, there's so many antennas that's I can't keep track the data. anymore. <laughs> I know, but that's what that is. So that's constantly looking for a handshake to the data that's coming out of here. You're right. So if you've got that in your neighborhood, plus these smart meters, it's tough, but... Beyond that, you know, this is all wireless, right. and wireless is far more easy to hack into than a hardwired cable. Right. So for thieves and stuff, they can now get your data. They know when your lights go off in the morning. They know when you come back at the end of the day. They know when your house is quiet during the day. So somebody who's ambitious enough could back up their truck and take your toys, and all that data is just out there. And then if you look at it from a national security standpoint, our, our CIA has already said wireless is a huge security breach for our nation because terrorists could come in and take us down. And you and I live in the Northeast, and it gets pretty darn cold. And if you manage to shut off our electric, our gas, and our water, that's a really awful scenario to be in here in, in January, February. So um, are you saying that there's potential to hack into the smart meters for each home and actually yeah. actually turn it off? Yeah. So they could just take down the grid. Take down the grid. Take down right. the whole grid. Right. So it's um, a vulnerability that's right. out there. It's yeah. a vulnerability. So then our data goes off to third-party analysts, which means manufacturers who want to sell us the Internet of Things. Right. So they have the data on what we're doing in our house. And now they can come market to us to say, hey, you can do it much more efficiently. You can do it wirelessly. You can do it from six towns over. You can open up right. your garage door. That sounds so fun. But people simply don't know that this is what we need to be concerned with, that that device is emitting microwave radiation through our homes. And if you've got a little kid, if you've got a pregnant woman, oh. if you've got an elderly because it messes with our you cognitive You can have your baby abilities. crib right next to it, you, the other side of the wall. Right. And you don't even know. And nobody knows. Right. And even worse, people who live in multi-unit dwellings like apartments and condos, they could be on the other side of the wall where the whole bank of 20 or 30 oh, of these are. I've seen it um, yeah. at a local sub shop across the street. Yeah. It was a nursery school, and I could see on the side is about 15 smart meters just 
on the side right. of the building. On a nursery on school. On a nursery school. It's oh like, gosh. oh God. I, now that I'm aware of it, I see it. Yeah. Before, you know, before this, yeah. before researching it, I, I would just yeah. would have, it wouldn't register no. in, my, in my mind. Because they're outside, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't think twice uh, about it, but you just informed me right. about the smart meter. And I, didn't I know had about a woman contact me recently because she's developed electrohypersensitivity because her body can't handle right. all that radiation coming all the time. And she doesn't know. Does she know why? Well, she does know okay, why, she and does. she said, and my landlord just installed the Internet of Thing washer dryers. So there's like 20 washers and dryers in the basement, and she's on the first floor. So all this radiation's coming at her, oh, and wow. she's getting sicker and sicker. I'm curious if you ever is she close by? No, she was in another state. Oh, okay, I was gonna say well, I was wondering what the meter would read on. Yeah, that. and if you can take a meter and go show yeah. the landlord, you know, because again, it's really hard to grasp this unless you have some quantitative you evidence. Gotta see it to believe it. Um, so anyway, um, that's the gist of the smart meters. And so this woman was calling to tell me that there was another bill related to mine right. that um, might be able to help citizens out in Worcester to opt out of that. So. With this environmental justice saying they go in, they make it look really good in one community, nobody knows to say anything, and then they say, look, it worked in Worcester, so now we're going to roll it out all across Massachusetts. We're hoping that won't happen. But the industry is very powerful. Um, so just to summarize, you have your bill, mm -hmm. and that's going to be up again for, say, review? Yeah. In coming up next year? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now this bill is also right. to opt out right. of Smart Grid in Worcester County. Yeah. Okay. So in addition to telling me about that bill, she called to tell me that there was a panel of world experts coming to Massachusetts to speak to our legislator about adopting right to know legislation. And who sparked that conversation? Who got them to come? Is that you? No. Oh, oh. gosh, no. Okay. Keith, up until this point, I was the only person I knew who could have a conversation about this. Yeah. So just for me to have another person on the other end of the phone, I was like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, finally. <laughs> you know, it's like a kid in a candy store. Yeah. Somebody I can talk to about this who knows so much more, who can guide me and That's talk how I felt when I found you. Right, right, right. It's like, whoa. Okay. And so now she's telling me there's a panel of world experts coming to Boston, and I can go and listen. Awesome. And bless them, because not only did they travel here on their own time and dime, but then they made themselves available that night to speak to a public forum, which, as luck would have it, was right in Framingham, which is one town over from me. So this is what it was. Um, it was the right to know about cell phone safety, implications of current science for policy. So okay. basically, our science today is there, but our policy is years behind. 1996? 1996. We FCC are living guidelines. the standards from 1996. Right. So, a lot changed since then. Yeah, and um, so Dr. Deborah Davis is a Nobel Peace Prize co-laureate on climate change. She was also responsible for getting cigarette smoking out of airplanes. Oh. She brought this panel of world experts in, and she came to talk to us about the science, about why this is biologically harmful. And she is the example of like the eye potty, where you plunk a little kid down on a potty seat, and then you put a tablet or a cell phone in front of them, keeps them entertained while they learn to do their business. She said, that's child abuse. You are putting that child in front of microwave radiation. And I sit in there going, whoa. Well, I've seen her videos. Yeah. She's very passionate. She is. And God so, love her. She's a mother and a grandmother. Right. And so, she knows what this is doing to right. us. So she's passionate because she knows yeah. the science behind it. Yeah. So she was here from the U.S. She brought with her Frank Clegg, who, as it turns out, is the retired president of Microsoft Canada. And I'm sitting there going, Wow, we've got a technology guy here, and from when Mr. Microsoft, yeah, from I mean, Microsoft. Really, um, and then when I thought about it, I credible. thought it's definitely credible. But Microsoft was software, not the hardware that's actually emitting mm -hmm. this stuff. Um, but when Mr. Clegg retired, he knew enough, being in the industry, not to have Wi-Fi in his house, even when his teen, his daughters were teenagers and clamoring for the latest technology, and and they have the means for it. But he said no. So that got my attention. Right. But then he said, when I retired, I went out and spoke personally with a dozen of the top scientists around the world. And I came back, and I can tell you that our standards in North America are not safe. Now he, did he bring us up during that meeting? Yeah. Okay. So now did. everyone's on edge yeah. listening. Yeah. So he turned around and resigned from every technology board that he was on, and he said to his peers, 
If somebody can prove to me that this is safe, let me know. And he said, my phone has never rung. So what Mr. Clegg did, and I just, I just love him because he's not one to sit still and let this just happen, you know, to take his cash and go. Right. He founded Canadians for Safe Technology, so they're ahead of us in Canada doing the advocacy with the legislature. And our FCC standards are equivalent to their Safety Code 6, right. and he's already gotten some inroads with Parliament in Canada to start examining that and moving it in the right direction. We need the first domino to fall. That's right. what we need, whether right. it comes from Canada or... Right, com right. right. So um, they also brought with them a woman from, I think she might be from Vermont, um, Janet Newton, who runs an organization to protect the employees who have to go up on the rooftops where all these antennas are mounted. We're supposed to have protocols in place to shut things down so when the employees are up there, and it could be the HVAC guys, it could be the elevator repair people. Good luck, right? It's the telecom people working on the antennas themselves. Yeah. And although we have some guidelines in place, they're not being adhered to, and people are getting sick. They're developing cancers. And I heart can't see them shutting a the cell phone tower down for maintenance for HVAC. No, it's so. unconscionable, though. And and they're not educating these people. And these guys got to do their job. Yeah. They need the money. They want need the, the job, paycheck. Get on the roof, right? So we're seeing uh, disease creep up in that population. So she's advocating to at least adhere to the standards that we have that we're not even paying attention to. Um, so the fourth person who came in, flew in all the way on his own time from India, is this Dr. Sharma, R.S. Sharma. And it's his job in the Indian government to recommend what the public exposure is for microwave radiation. And he, in his country, they do the studies within the government. And he's done some of the sperm studies and some of the other ones. So he knows that this is biologically harmful. So his standards in India were right up about where the U.S. is. Mm -hmm. He has now gotten new standards in place that take it down 90%. They're still in the That's midst impressive. of figuring out how to actually implement that. But at least they've taken it down 90% of what ours still are today. Because I know in India, the infrastructure really is, wasn't there for right. landline phones. Yeah. So everybody adopted cell phones because it was so easy, right? right. So efficient But now that we know there's biological harm, we just have to solve the problem. Right. And we're just at one point in time, and, and we'll get there. The fifth and final panelist member who came was Dr. Catherine Steiner Adair. And I was like, well, I've learned about the biological harm, but what's a child psychologist doing here? And I was so grateful for her talk. Um, and we will do a full episode on this and talk about what all of this technology is doing to us developmentally and what it's doing to our children and our family relationships. <sighs> so Biological is enough. Do I really need that, psychological that's exactly now? How I was feeling. Can you keep adding on uh, more dangers? No. But once you get your head around it, the solutions are all the same. It's common yeah. sense, right? Limit your exposure and do what we need to do to develop properly as human beings. That's true connections with one another. So I was so grateful, and I was um, able to do some publicity in the town of Ashland around this. We had a new, um, a new monthly uh, newspaper that came out, and so I was able to put in a couple articles to let people know, and there were people in other towns doing the same. We had Framingham, we had Whalen, we had dover Sherborne, we had Natick. Um, and so sure. we actually yeah. filled this, this church basement in Framingham at the Plymouth Church, and it was a great conversation. There was some great questions and answers, and all of these talks are out on YouTube. You can get out to all of them online. Um, so that was pretty fabulous because in a, a month's time, I went from not having anybody I knew who could really talk about this to having access to these world experts, and it was during those forums that it was called out that Ashland Public Schools was the first in the nation to have best practices put in place, because I had no idea. Right. I thought maybe the first in my yeah. Metro West area, yeah. or maybe around the Boston area, or maybe the state, but I had no idea that just that, just what I had done, made us the first in the nation. And you're thinking, like, how can this be? It's crazy. How can this be? I, yeah. Aren't there other people like those right. things as well? Right, and there are. There definitely are. There They've come out yeah. to find me, and I get calls all the time right. or emails all the time and because every community is saying, how can we get there? How can we get right. there? So I'm honored to be able to take our lessons learned and to move those forward. And that's when you came to Pepperell. 
I yeah. invited you up. Yeah. And um, I contacted our school committee. Mm -hmm. They welcomed you and yeah. me. I have to say, Keith, your superintendent, your school committee chairwoman, and your IT director were unbelievable when Absolutely. they sat down and listened to they this. They gave us an hour and a half. They gave I us an so hour surprised. and a half. Um, they had done their homework. They yeah. were referencing documents and asking very intelligent questions. And then, of course, we measured their devices so they could really understand right. what this is. I think they feel the same way Ashland mm -hmm. Public School District fe yeah. felt. Where do we go from here? Right. I believe they're on their own, uh, re doing their own research Good. now. Good. So, and it does take time. It yeah. takes time for people to come into the fold. I have found that one-on-one -on -one conversations are the best way to do this because we all have our other jobs to do. We all have our work. Right. And so something coming in an email, if I got to run out the door to a meeting, I may or may not remember to come back and look at that. So set up a meeting, one-on-one, -on -one, walk somebody through the issues, mm -hmm. and then you're all on the same page. It's a level playing field, and now we can work towards solutions. And also I want to mention that we also brought it to the Pepperell Board of Health. Yes. Which is one of the reasons why we're talking here yeah, today. Yeah, it was fantastic. Right? So it kind of has a life of its own. Yeah. Uh, you spread yeah. the word. But you need somebody to drive it. You need somebody yeah. like yourself who's a, a concerned citizen. I'm just a dad. With well, two kids don't in the school say system. just a dad. That's well, a I huge really, that's job. All I am. Yeah, right. I'm not. Right. I'm not getting paid to sit here no. and talk with you. I'm right. just concerned about my kids right. exposed to 1,200 hours of microwave radiation in school. You know, 14,000 hours from K to 12. That's right. why I'm here. My right. heart jumps to my stomach well, every time. As a dad, what I'm supposed to do? Just let it go up. by. Right. You know? I mean, this is real evidence. Right. So. Anyway. And it is. So. Thanks to people like you who are starting to tune in. And, you know, back in 1996 when the FCC put their guidelines in place, we didn't have the access to the Internet like we have today. Every parent can sit down and start doing oh, their yeah. research. All and the information that you yeah, brought up is all it available is. And to everybody at home. At the end of this video, there yeah. will be some links that people can go to because literally I spent three years sifting through all of this to get to the truth. We'll cut you right to the chase. And by all means, still go do all your own research if you're inclined. But Absolutely. we can at least point you to scientific yeah. evidence that's not industry funded. And those of you who have, do take the initiative to inform other people about the dangers, yeah. remember there's always three stages of truth. Right. Right. First one's a ridicule. Mm. Right. Violent opposition. Mm -hmm. And finally, acceptance. Yeah. So I don't know what stage we're at right now. Right, it's definitely right, not right, acceptance. Right, right. We're somewhere in there, we're but we're going to get to the We're still in the stage, I think. By some. But then once people start listening in, it all comes full circle. Right. Um, so looking back in my community, when I first started learning about this, you know, I had been doing grant writing for our Ed Foundation and for our schools. So I knew we had a pot of money in the town of Ashland that gets redistributed back out in the form of grants to the community. So I thought, well, why don't we get a meter? put one in the schools, yeah. put one in the library, and then the whole community can borrow it and remediate their spaces. But this was so new that the first time I applied for the grant, they're like, um, well, come back next time. So I reapplied a second time. Okay. And then they're like, oh, it's probably more a Board of Health issue. But I already knew our Board of Health didn't understand this. Nor so did I the thought, Massachusetts Board of No. Health. So huh. thankfully, I had Senator Spilka. So after this panel of world experts came to the State House, the next month, my bill came up for hearing. So I took my three minutes, and I, you know, I, I had the bio-initiative report. I had Ashland's best practices. I had my meter I could show them. And I was like this in three minutes, trying to it, yeah. convey as much as, as calmly and as reasonably right. as one can. It goes by fast, right? But while I was doing that, I was watching the faces of every member of the Joint Committee on Public Health. And I could tell they were in shock and awe. Really? They had no idea that this issue even existed. So I thought, OK. I'm grateful for this opportunity to testify. And there were a number of other Massachusetts residents who came and spoke as well. So it wasn't just my voice. Right. Um, and I was so grateful for everybody who came in. Um, so I realized, you know what? I'm going to need to meet with every one of those people in order for them to understand what this issue is. So I did. I spent last summer and fall meeting one by one with every member on the Joint Committee on Public Health. and. Almost to the person, when I started the conversation to say, you know, can you help me to understand what you might know about health issues surrounding Wi-Fi, every one of them said, well, I really don't know much. And I thought, okay. One gentleman, 
young man just fresh out of Suffolk Law School, um, working for one of the senators or representatives, said, well, I know a little bit about it. And he let me talk for a good hour or so. And at the end of it, he said, well, I actually get what you're saying because my father was the physicist who brought the team into Chernobyl in Russia after it blew. And I went, oh. So he understands what radiation does. Right. Um, but he was the only person out of all the dozens and dozens of people I spoke to who had any idea. So that's how effective the industry has been at not allowing evidence of harm to hit the mainstream. That sounds very familiar of things in the past. Yeah, like the tobacco, tobacco industry, industry, asbestos. Now, if anyone um, wants to uh, see, the, compare the two, Wi-Fi and smoking, is something you can do at home. You can look at the videos of uh, commercials from the 50s, and you'll look at those videos today, you're like, oh my God. The doctor smoking. The doctor's in a white coat. Well, it must be okay, right? <laughs> Pregnant women. I even saw uh, the Flintstones uh, yeah. enjoying their Winstons. Oh, jeez. I was like, okay, so these are little kids from the 50s watching these commercials, right? Smoking yeah. is great. Smoking. Right, right, right. No harm, no All danger. All in the house, and, and then now, we wound up with what? Asthma, lung cancer. So I compare cancer. that with yeah. the advertising of Wi-Fi today. Right. You look at McDonald's, what do they have? They have a Big Mac carton open up like a laptop, mm -hmm. and there's a guy typing on it saying, you know, free Wi-Fi. Yeah. So it's in your, it's yeah. in your mind thinking it must be yeah. safe, must be fine. But you're right, Keith, we are at one point in time, Yeah. and there's lots we can do. So. Um, after I met with all of those legislators, I also met with the governor's office, um, and I met with my state um, federal legislators as well, Senator Markey's office and Senator Warren's office, mm -hmm. because and, and Catherine Clark's office, our, our federal representative in Congress, because we all need to get this conversation going. So You're really hitting all of them. I mean, you're... I, you are I gotta spreading try the word because and, if we don't know and yeah. if, if the bill goes into effect, yeah. people need to know. So I'm just <coughs> you hit the state really, level, now you're going yeah. to the federal level. Planting seeds is yeah. the best I can okay. do. Yeah. <coughs> but after having these conversations, something clicked in my head and said, Oh, I probably need to double back to my town and start having one on one conversations. <coughs> so I went and I met with each member of our board of selectmen asked if I could meet with them privately, individually, and I taught them what I had since learned because when I first gave them that grant application, I didn't know a whole lot other than there's a lot of evidence of harm. Now I could talk to the issue. So I taught them, you know, what the science is telling us. Like are you and today. Yeah, and measured their devices, yeah. and I submitted my grant application for a third time, and um, they did give me one meter to donate to our library, and so Ashland Public Schools actually has, or Ashland Public Library, I'm sorry, has an acoustometer that now has a barcode on it, comes in its little pouch. Oh, it's like taking out a book, right? Yeah, it is. And um, so they said... Have people been, uh, can you check to yeah, see if they Yeah, you can check it out. And I can go on and see if it's checked out. People are checking it Yeah, oh, they are. Excellent. And as I begin doing more one-on-one -on -one education in our community, yeah. it will be checked out, you know, very consistently, I'm confident. Excellent. Um, so that happened last summer. The bill came up for hearing last summer. This panel of experts came up last summer. It's a lot summer. of information here. You're doing an yeah. excellent job in spreading and the word. Because I had put a couple articles out and put a couple posts on our town Facebook mm -hmm. page, um, somebody came to me and said, well, we're going to do a health and wellness day at the farmer's market on this date. Would you like to do a booth? Huh? And I thought, that's awesome. So I did. I brought my materials, I brought my meter, and just had lovely conversations all day. And I was so happy to see that not everybody has fallen into buying a smartphone. There were people who still had flip phones, track phones. So not everybody has the latest and greatest. But so, they wish they could, right? Well, <laughs> they know enough to be cautious. They that, remember There's two things, about, right? One, they can't afford one because they're yeah. expensive, like, what, $700, right? right? And they but, don't want to be married to it, Yeah. which is part and of the, it. The other side, like, my father was happy with the old phones. Yeah. He understands them. Yeah. You know? So Ashland Public Library has run other series, like on GMOs and what they do mm -hmm. to our health. Um, and as luck would have it, the booth next to mine was the GMO booth. There were people there talking about, because at a farmer's market, you have a lot of organic oh, right. farming. Yeah. So it's a great opportunity to educate people on why we don't want to eat food that's been chemically grown. And it looked like it was going to rain, and I'd been able to borrow a canopy 
So the GMO booth said, would you mind if we squeeze in under your table? And I said, sure. And so we had, you know, our two tables like a V, and a gentleman came up and he's looking at GMOs and he's looking at EMFs or electromagnetic fields from Wi-Fi. And he said, so which one should I pay attention to? And I said, sir, I totally get your question, but we're only one body. We have to come up to speed on how to keep this one body healthy. Right. And it likely includes eliminating toxins from food, but also eliminating toxins from Wi-Fi technology. Right. He said, oh, okay, so great question. Another great thing happened that day is our, a gentleman from our library came up to me and said, you know, we do these film series, what would you think if we did the next one on electromagnetic radiation and health? And I thought, I can't believe you just did that because I've been toying with the idea, but I hadn't quite gotten up the nerve to come ask you guys about it yet. And he said, well, I think we can do it. So that other woman, Patricia Burke, and I um, gave him some tips on what he might like to consider in that six-part series. Was she the uh, Worcester County? Yeah, she's the Worcester okay. one who's trying to the get bill. that opt-out bill yeah. through. So um, sure enough, they put together a six-part film and discussion series that had experts. It, there are DVDs out there about this issue, you know, about smart meters, about the science, you know. There's a European journalist who did Microwave Science and Lies, which expose how even the World Health Organization has some people in there who are very friendly with the industry. So, but there's great resources out there. And okay. um, so I've since learned that Ashland is the first library in the country to have Another a meter first. for the residents. Another first. And we're the first to have this um, series that other communities could definitely emulate. Absolutely. Um, so there was a lot happening at the state yeah. level. And when that panel of experts came to Boston, they reached out to the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and had a private audience with them and got them up to speed on what this was. Excellent. Um, and they were very, very pleased and grateful to be informed. But like our schools, when 9-11 happened, all of our budgets got slashed at the state level, at the school, municipal level. So everybody's resources got cut, and our Department of Public Health had to cut some of their staff. So they are just now being able to fill positions they had to cut and staff up, especially in the Environmental Bureau. When we look around at all the environmental toxins today, I can't imagine how swamped they are. Um, so I met with them a couple of months ago and have since been in touch with them and they've been able to hire a new epidemiologist and they're hiring another one and between them they're going to be able to start paying attention to electromagnetic radiation and public health. That's, so that's I'm hopeful great. that just as you know when the H1N1 virus came about we were getting information from our schools and from our state how to look at this toxin and how to keep a safer um, approach to it. So I'm hoping that um, we can do that at the state level. And then, if the Department of Public Health can issue fact sheets on this, that's what our schools are looking that's for. That's what they need. They need authority yeah. to say, They look. need authority, so. Because they all look upstream. Right, so either the bill will happen or these fact sheets will happen. Okay. Hopefully they will all happen eventually. But if we can get those synergies, then that gives everybody the authority to say, okay, here we go, and we're going to do what's right by our kids. All right, so just to summarize here, mm -hmm. a lot of information you gave mm -hmm. us and the, and the viewers. So yeah. you started at the grassroots, mm -hmm. you brought it to your school, mm -hmm. you brought it to your senator, mm -hmm. you brought it to the, the state legislature, mm -hmm. you brought it to the feds, mm -hmm. you also brought it to the attorney general. I did. All right, so can we keep a short version sure. of that? Okay. So just a couple of weeks ago, the Attorney General's office put out a flyer that they were going to have a listening section session on energy, a couple of sessions actually, in Worcester and in Springfield. And when the people started showing up to talk about their community concerns, I think they were mostly expecting to hear about the pipeline and maybe the cost overruns that are happening with that smart utility grid that's being piloted. What they didn't know is the biological harm. Right. And there were enough people talking about it. We had building biologists there. We had advocates. We had people with electrohypersensitivity who were explaining what makes them sick with this technology. And for the first time, they were hearing biological harm. And so now the Attorney General's office is investigating. And honestly, I didn't know what the Attorney General's office was, but it turns out it's the people's lawyer. Okay. So when you've got these huge lobbyists, with deep pockets, who represents the people? I don't know. 
The Attorney General's office, as it turns out. That's I look at it. Nobody's yeah. looking out for us. Yeah, but they it's are. just me. And they just did a really <laughs> good thing by stopping that pipeline from coming well, through that was, here. Yes. That's huge. So yeah, if they huge. have that capacity to dive this. in deep, I'm hoping they can You've join done in this conversation. Exceptional job. You know, we brought this segment to be informing the, the wider community. And yeah. you've gone all the way, yeah. except it, the president. You haven't gone there yet. Well, we'll try. <laughs> okay. We'll try. Well, let's save that for Can another day. Can I mention day. one more oh, local thing? Absolutely, sure. So right around the same time last summer as the farmer's market, this expert panel, my bill came up for hearing. Yep. I didn't have anything to do with this. This is the Boston Parents paper. And when their journalist um, figured out what this issue was, they cleared everything else off the cover of theirs and just put this little boy behind a tablet with school bus colors and said, is Wi-Fi in school safe? A look at the potential dangers. And I was like, wow, talk about pennies from heaven. Yeah, this that's just, not just an internet article. No, that's this is huge. It printed was free and, in yeah. every public library. It was distributed through our grocery stores. And it has Camilla Reese, who is an expert on this. She's a high finance woman who became electro-hypersensitive. And for the last eight years, she's been educating people and pulling together the scientists into forums where they can inform other scientists and medical people. I feel there's a momentum building. So she sent out a press release a long time ago, and they held it for their back-to-school issue last year. And then Dr. Martha Herbert over at the Autism Lab is also quoted in here, and they give a good list of things to do to protect yourself. Wow, that's all. Awesome. That's excellent work. I Thank you. So let's, mm -hmm. we'll, um, we'll hold it there. Yep. There's a lot of information for everyone to digest. Yeah. And um, our next episode, we'll talk about why don't we know about this? Okay. Why, why don't we know about Wi-Fi dangers? I was surprised when I found out there was... Ditto. Right? So yeah. I'm sure some of you at home feel the same way. Yeah, but so. there's a lot of good reasons, and we'll be happy to share them. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.